Hi everyone. I hope you enjoyed our last panel. My name is Carrie Ann Trubenstein and I am the new coordinator for the CPR Institute. I oversee programming and I work closely with our members to make our committee meetings unique and exciting. I'm always looking for new ideas and topics, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have something in mind. It's nice to virtually meet everyone and I hope you enjoy our next panel. Why do IT outsourcing projects fail? How to keep them going with dispute resolution boards and standing neutrals. Join me in welcoming our next moderator, Zach Hill. Zach is a partner in Morgan Lewis's San Francisco office. He represents clients in the technology, energy, and pharmaceutical industries with a particular focus on competition and contract disputes in the business software space. Well, thank you. And thank you all for attending. And I'm looking forward to a great discussion on the topic today. Uh, let me first introduce our panelists. Um, first, we've got Kate Vitasek. She is an international authority for her award-winning research and vested business model for highly collaborative relationships. She is the author of seven books and a faculty member at the University of Tennessee. And she has been lauded by World Trade Magazine as one of the fabulous 50 plus one most influential people impacting global commerce. Ms. Vitasek has been featured on CNN International, Bloomberg, NPR, and on Fox Business News. Her work has also been featured in over 300 articles. And next we have Cherry Fisher. She is a civil engineer who brings more than three decades of on-site construction and claims experience to her early dispute resolution practice. She is adept at breaking down complex technical issues into clear, concise summaries. She provides construction claims analysis, litigation support, and expert testimony to attorneys, insurance companies, and public entities. In addition, Ms. Fisher serves as a construction partnering facilitator and DRB panel member for the Ohio Department of Transportation, Caltrans, and CPR. And we also have David Friedlinger, who is an attorney and managing partner at Swedish law firm Serio. He is an expert in complex customer supplier contracts, such as outsourcing and supply chain. David is also an expert in the area of relational contracts and vested. He has assisted a number of world leading companies to establish the vested model in global outsourcing deals and has authored and co authored three books and two Harvard Business Review articles on the subject. David also acts as standing neutral in vested deals. So the plan for this session is I'm going to start out by talking briefly about uh, some common IT outsourcing projects and how they sometimes fail and, and the consequences of that failure. And then I'm going to turn it over to Kate Vitasek, who will discuss from an academic perspective the use of a standing neutral. And then we'll go to Cherry Fisher and David Friedlinger, who will discuss their experience and perspective as standing neutrals. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions. So let me start with just some brief table setting by discussing uh, some a, a common type of IT outsourcing project um, that can fail and might benefit from the use of a standard neutral. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is IT outsourcing in the software implementation context. And what we're talking about here is large enterprises or governmental organizations um, that for almost any part of their business, they use some type of software. Um, and I, I think you'd be hard pressed to name a large organization that at this moment isn't uh, undergoing some type of implementation for new software, um, whether it's related to its supply chain, its HR, um, you know, any, any part of its business. Um, that could be you know, moving from on-premise software to cloud-based software. It could be switching cloud data vendors, like moving from AWS to Google or from Microsoft Azure to Oracle and so on. Uh, you could have a situation where uh, you've got a new CIO with a mandate to consolidate vendors. Um, and instead of using different vendors for uh, its HR and supply chain and financials, it's using one vendor for, for all those components. Um, or it could be all, all three of those types of changes at, at one time. Uh, for that type of large project, we're talking about a years long effort. Um, we're talking about just to start out tens of millions of dollars, um, a, a huge, huge uh, resource 
dedication. Um, and, and no, even the, the largest organizations don't have um, that type of in-house expertise to handle that type of implementation. So that's where the IT outsourcing component uh, to this comes in. Um, the large organizations will hire dozens, if not hundreds of consultants and programmers and with, with varying types of expertise from the functional side on the technical side, usually from multiple different vendors to handle this type of, of implementation. Um, they, they've got to make sure that all the components of the software work together with your existing software, with all the vendors that you use, um, and that you know, everything flows so that at the end of the day, uh, your sales team can enter a sale that gets properly funneled to your supply chain uh, so it can be sourced and manufactured and shipped um, and to your financials so that the order can be properly accounted for for your next month end close and, and so on all down the line. Um, so because of that complexity of these projects and just the nature of, of, of how complex the software is, uh, these projects can fail uh, at multiple points. Um, someone can just make a simple mistake. Uh, these are mission critical components of a business. Um, so if the mistake results in, for example, your customers aren't able to enter in orders, or if you can't ship properly, or if you have um, errors in your financial report, obviously all those things are a huge issue uh, for your business. Uh, sometimes people can overpromise, or uh, on the customer side, uh, someone might have unrealistic expectations. Um, so at the end of the day, if expected or promised functionality isn't delivered, that's obviously going to be a problem. Or if efficiency gains aren't realized. Um, you know, for example, you're expecting the new software to save you 20% headcount in your accounting team. Well, if the new complexities make you double your accounting team, that's, that's going to be a problem. And then project delays and, and going over budget uh, it's, it's also uh, a common problem here. Um, you know, if, if you've got um, a go live date for the new software, April 1st, and at, around that same time, you're expecting to phase out your old software and all the infrastructure that supports that. Uh, so if you blow through that go live date, then you're looking at paying for another year for your old software while also paying for the new software. Um, so that, that gets expensive quickly. Um, so if any of those types of failures happen, there's plenty of blame to go around, again, due to the complexity here. Um, was it the consultant who coded something wrong? Uh, was it the company organization who didn't um, properly train the employees or didn't take the implementation seriously enough? Um, was it the outsourcing firm sales team who overpromised? Um, so again, lots of blame to go around. And if that blame turns into litigation, um, I can tell you from experience, I've been on both sides of this type of litigation, from the customer side and the vendor side, it gets expensive very quickly. Um, again, because of the complexities, uh, there's many vendors involved, many contractors, and any clever litigator can draft a complaint that's going to survive a motion to dismiss. Um, if you're in arbitration, it's dispositive motions early on are, are not favored. So very likely you're going into discovery. Um, and when you're in, once you're in discovery, you've got hundreds of people on the employee side, you've got hundreds of people on the contractor side, that means you've got dozens of depositions to pay for. Um, you've got tens of millions of documents that you've got to pay to host um, and review. You've got complex technical issues, you need to hire experts on both sides to deal with that. Um, so again, failures, if they lead to litigation, can be very costly. Um, very expensive very quickly. So given those all those potential failure points and uh, the potential for very high litigation and business costs uh, in these types of software implementations, it would obviously be wise to take whatever reasonable measures you can to avoid the failures or to resolve the disputes as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, and using a standing neutral in that type of circumstance um, could be very useful. So at the risk of putting myself out of work as a, as a litigator in this area, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Vitasek now um, to talk about some of the academic underpinnings of uh, the use of a standing neutral and how to effectively implement it. So Kate, it's all yours. Thank you, Jeff. Um, 
Excellent. Well, thanks, Zach, for um, tossing it over. And, and what I want to do is just share this some leading academic research that we've done at the University of Tennessee. Um, first, full disclosure, I am not an attorney. I am not an attorney. I'm not a lawyer. I've never been to law school. I don't pretend to. I'm a supply chain practitioner academic. So I look in supply chain how things work, why they don't work, and how to get them to work. And that led to our research beginning in 2003 that was actually funded by the United States Air Force and the Department of Defense. Because you think about these large uh, services acquisitions, these big deals that the Air Force and Department of Defense have, and they're like, why are some of these wildly successful and some of these just not so successful? So they came to us at the University of Tennessee to begin to ask that question, is there a better way? How do we structure these deals? How do we prevent you know, going to, going to court? Because as y'all said, it's expensive and it's not fun. You know, I've, I've not been in a lawsuit, so I don't know how that works, but I can only imagine it's totally not fun. So our job is really to look at how to make these work and work better. So uh, it's led to seven books on the topic, as Zach mentioned, but also one of the things that we, would, we recommended back uh, in our first book in 2011 was this concept of a standing neutral. Uh, and it's by standing, it is part of the deal. It's part of the governance structure. So it's not something you do ad hoc afterwards, right? Oh, we're on trouble, let's go find our mediator or let's go find our arbitrator. You wanna bring that in uh, early. And I'll be talking a little bit about that. But uh, a lot of folks would look at this and they'd scratch their head and they go, wow, I love a lot of what you're teaching. We can bring in a lot of this great stuff and they would not apply the standing neutral and, and it really puzzled me like why aren't people putting in this concept because when it's there it's working very well uh, and, and so we wanted to do some deeper dive research so a, a couple three years ago um, we began to do some very deep dive research actually um, Jim Groton um, retired attorney from um, uh, really a pioneer in the field of standing neutrals. We began collaborating him and another academic, uh, Dan um, Bumbledoss. And so that work and that research, this deeper dive research, uh, has led to a white paper called Unpacking the Standing Neutral. Uh, and that's what I wanna share, is just a little snippet out of here so that you can see that the concepts of why and what and how these things work have massive merit at preventing conflict, right? Not resolving it after it comes up, but preventing it early on. So what is a standing neutral? Well, it's, it's an innovative and proactive improvement on what I would think of as your traditional alternative dispute resolution techniques. So for many, many years, we've had arbitrators and mediators, and we, we try to, to, to get folks to resolve disputes. Um, and where a standing neutral comes in and says, how about if we focus on preventing the disputes? Um, so a, a standing neutral is a highly qualified or respected pre-selected expert. So they're not something after the fact, you're gonna pre-select them and they will be part of your governance team on whatever it is. If it's a large outsourcing deal, if it's a construction project, you're gonna bring them in up front to be uh, early into your relationship. Um, and, and sometimes it's actually part of the deal, uh, structuring the deal. We'll talk about that in a minute, how these are used. So you want to, uh, as a buyer or supplier or the contracting entities, you have the power to give your standing neutral powers. So it could be, you know, just give me advice. I've got this situation that comes up. How, do, how should we deal with it? Um, it could be, you know, a formal recommendation, non-binding. It could actually be a binding recommendation. So your standing neutral may or may not be an arbitrator, right? But they would be part of the governance. So you would know in advance if you were going to have a dispute, who is going to be the person that's going to do this. So why would you bring in these neutrals up front way early? Well, it, it helps in facilitating problem solving in a much more timely and cost effective manner. Because if I can solve these problems before, if I can solve something before it becomes an issue, right? It, and, and we solve it when it's tiny, an ounce of prevention, 
right, is, is, is you know, going to save us tons of money and time and energy. And it helps the parties see each other's perspective. You know, oftentimes we sit across the table. We have the buyer and the supplier. We see things from our different lens. And the neutral can help kind of turn that problem around, ask questions, encourage people to look at that problem from a different angle while it's still really small before people have gotten positional or emotional. And it creates a proactive and constructive dialogue in your day-to-day discussions. So for example, let's say that you have an issue log and you have a monthly meeting, a monthly review meeting or a quarterly business review meeting, your standing neutral is going to be watching, you know, uh, participating in that monthly review issue review log and seeing if there's alignment, misalignment or things getting solved in a timely manner. So they're helping to prevent the issues, a small issue from growing into something much bigger. So how does it work? Well, the parties select a trusted neutral. So it's, it's really, it is not the buyer, for example, if I'm doing a large IT deal, the buyer is not simply saying, this is the standing neutral. It is something that both parties have to agree to. Now notice we use the word standing. And so a standing neutral isn't something necessarily that you do ad hoc or after the fact. You can do that, but we would actually encourage you to bring them in forward into a more of a upfront role. And they're different than a mediator. Um, A mediator is typically brought in um, ad hoc by attorneys once an issue turns into into a dispute, while a standing neutral is ongoing, it's embedded into the governance structure. So in essence, it's integrated. It's integrated into your governance and escalation to try to solve small problems before they get to be a dispute. I have here a a graph from the white paper, uh, the dispute resolution continuum, right? So on the far right side of the the continuum, this is your most expensive and adversary or binding resolution, arbitration, um, litigation. And on the far left is where we'd have more preventive measures. So a standing neutral is really bringing in right, bringing in and looking at how do I bring this neutral concept into dispute control, maybe even further upstream into problem solving, maybe further upstream into prevention. Can we actually use our neutrals and the skills of our neutrals to help organizations see different perspectives and solve things before they get too big? So here's some examples. Um, In the white paper, we have a lot of different examples of these in practice. Um, The most common actually is in the construction industry. And I'm glad that Sherry is actually joining us today because she is a standing neutral uh, as part of a dispute review board in the construction industry. And you look at the history, you know, if we, we, from a research perspective, if we look at the history of standing neutrals, they've been around for a long time actually. So some literally can trace them back you know, a a couple hundred years that organizations have used these. They're just not used very often. Um, And about the 1970s, um, the construction industry began to use dispute review boards. Um, They're often called dispute review boards. Sometimes if they're doing formal dispute resolution it'd be a dispute adjudication board. Um, But they're bringing these in with an effort to control and to problem solve more early. So that's the most common place we've seen it. And we started to look at these outsourcing deals. So when the Air Force and the Department of Defense came to us, it was like, well, why aren't you doing this? This is what the construction industry is is doing. Uh, And they never heard of the concept. Well, what do you mean? I've never seen that before. Well, just because you've never done it in your industry doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, And so we started to look around and say, where are people using neutrals in more preventive, proactive ways? Um, And so sometimes um, in the construction industry, most often, and I'll let Sherry speak to this, it's usually a board. It's three people. It's not a single. Now, a standing neutral can be, and what we see in most business applications, non-constructions, if we were looking at an IT deal, for example, or a facilities management type deal or any other type of deal, most 
deals are a sing single standing neutral. You don't have a board. In the construction industry, it tends to be a board, and Sherry can explain more about that as, because she is a, 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 you know, a, a standing neutral in the construction industry. So here's an example, Microsoft. Um, so they use it to control disputes. Uh, and, and I'll give a good example of this later. But it's um, a, an outside consultant, not a lawyer, not, um, you know, so not an arbitrator, a mediator, but a professional business person who is an expert in the field that is being outsourced. And uh, in the area that we studied and, and profiled in the case study here was facilities management. So they're using that standing neutral to help look at the scorecard. Often the supplier scorecard, there is incentives or penalties associated with a supplier's ability to perform. And so the supplier goes, well, I got a five. And the buyer goes, well, no, you get a three. And so they use their standing neutral to actually, as an expert, say, you know, it's not a five and it's not a three. It's really a 3.8. So they're, they're, they're passing their judgment, helping each other see you know, what's truth somewhere in the middle. Now in, um, you know, uh, South Korea, they have a, a, a case that we looked at, the use of an ombudsman office. And here, what they've done in this case study is they've given their neutral the ability to be a mediator. So this is unlike Microsoft, not a mediator, not an arbitrator, a business person. Here, the standing neutral is a mediator. Right, so they're giving advice, uh, helping early on to, to control the disputes before they actually get to a dispute. Notice that we we use we start to use the word dis, you know, dispute and, and up here, but often this is a very upfront. Now Toyota, interesting example. Toyota with their dealers in their dealer network uses a standing board, so they have several people that are that are neutrals. They're named neutrals. So when a dealer and Toyota, the parent Toyota company, have an issue, they go to the um, standing arbitrator. And so they have uh, rules and how they work. And what I like about this, even though it's an arbitrator and they're doing this kind of the final resolution of issues, it's standing. So they can get through very, very quickly. So it's not, oh, well now let's go find an arbitrator, right? They have a formal process and they use the process and you know, I've got something with this dealer here and this dealer here. So all the dealers in Toyota agree to the process up front and who will be these neutrals. And in this case, they've given their neutrals the ability to have binding arbitration. And what I think is interesting about Toyota is Toyota, man, uh, the Toyota, the big parent company has said, I will, agree to binding arbitration. Whatever the arbitrator says, I agree to. But if you smaller dealer, you're coming against me, the big, big Toyota, if you don't think that the process that we jointly as a system have outlined with our standing neutrals as arbitrators, if you don't think it's fair, you can go ahead and sue me, but I will never sue you. I will never go to litigation because I trust the system. And what that does is it has significantly expedited the problem solving process and people trust the process. And in that case, again, they have given the standing neutrals a uh, position of an arbitrator. They're, they're formally trained arbitrators. Now this polar opposite, David's gonna talk about this. Um, this is Telia uh, and Veolia. Telia is a Swedish telco uh, and they outsource their maintenance. They're, um, think about the telco, you've got all of the, uh, the towers and different things that you're maintaining. Um, and so David played a role of way up front as what we call a deal architect or a partner facilitator as a neutral. So even though David's a lawyer, he doesn't work for Telia or Veolia. He's bringing in, helping the parties come to a fair and balanced contract up front. He's gonna talk more about that one. Um, here's an example, the brand, a branding and licensing deal. And it's probably the most comprehensive that I've seen. It used the neutral upfront to develop the deal. It's part of issue resolution and dispute control. So the same neutral stays without those partners throughout. And if needed, provides formal 
uh, arbitration, binding arbitration. Right? So in the franchise industry, they have, uh, they actually call their neutrals, they have a name for them. Uh, they're called the Wise Persons Committee. And it is like in the construction industry, there's, there's more than one. Um, so they actually have a committee. So when the franchise and the franchisee has an issue, they would go toward, towards, uh, they would go to this committee who would seek to not only dis to solve or help the team solve and give advice early on, but would facilitate any resolution like a mediator. So they are again standing. Um, a different outsourcing deal put their neutral into the problem solving, issue resolution, part of governance. Every, every month we have an issue log. My neutral's gonna show up and they're just gonna help us walk through and see each other's perspective while issues are small. Now, Jim Groton, um, who I mentioned is a, a co-author on this, and I, to me, the, the father of the modern standing neutral concept, he has uh, done a lot of work in the real estate industry and there's a great example here in the case study of how a real estate developer worked with, um, you know, it's um, the funding folks and the construction folks to help drive success in that. So here it was more of dispute control and facilitated resolution. And so even though this was real estate development and construction, it's not your typical dispute review board. And what's fun, in this case, actually, it was more of a standby neutral instead of a standing neutral. And what we see is just having that stand, even if it's standby, they aren't, you know, their, their ability to be able to solve problems, even if they're not in every single meeting every time, but they're there, they're on quick call. You know, they call, call up, hey, help, I need your advice. Now here is a union contract. This was really fascinating. A union contract where the neutral actually helped the buyer and the supplier, the, the union, um, uh, develop a, a contract. Now this contract, the buyer, uh, the buying company and the union were actually in lawsuits. This was a big, huge uh, healthcare doctors uh, and the neutral came in and said, all right, let's just, you know, let's get out of, you know, get out of lawsuits and let's have a different conversation. So as a neutral helped in the, in the development of the contract, not in mediating, but actually in facilitating the development of the contract. Um, an NGO, again, they're using a, a, a wise person's committee and you can see it's spanning. And then um, often in um, when we have joint ventures or some kind of a you know, more legal entity with different partners, you might see standing neutrals be, uh, play the role of an outside director. So there's no one way, when we say standing neutral, it's not this thing, but rather it's a concept where you're bringing in a neutral, instead of just in our mediation and arbitration, you're bringing them in up front, much more proactive, more preventive, all the way up in many cases to the deal development so that you're designing fair and balanced deals, you're solving problems when they're small issues and they are standing. So here's an example, this is a real example, this comes straight out of a contract. Um, so in the contract it talks about, they have a dispute clause and it says we're gonna use our governance and when we use our governance, this is the flow that we will use and you can see they have embedded a standing neutral uh, fairly low, it's actually at the, not the lowest operational level, um, but that next level. And they have used a standby neutral. So when something's not resolved, it goes up to the operational committee. And if they can't resolve it in the first shot, right? So it comes up, they have their monthly meeting. If they can't resolve it, it goes up to include the standing neutral. And then if they can't resolve it, it goes up to the next tier in governance and the standing neutral then will make a formal res recommendation. So here, same standing neutral, advice, right? Can't solve it, it's gonna go up. The higher level governance committee is going to see that, they're gonna see the advice from the standing neutral and, and if they can't resolve it, they have said, I trust the standing neutral, give us your formal recommendation. And if the parties don't agree with the formal recommendation, they can still go to 
top to top in binding arbitration. So there's nothing preventing them from moving forward, but what it's doing is emphasizing that that solving very early on. And that's straight out of a contract, by the way. So this, this chart, there's lots of words around it, but this chart is a concept coming straight out of an outsourcing contract. So the standing neutral works well because misalignments can be handled early. Again, I'm a supply chain person, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a mediator, an arbitrator, an attorney trying to mitigate these. I look at how do you, how do you actually keep the peace and get things working? Uh, and that's the emphasis of the standing neutral. And research has shown that when you, and, and, and trust me, I have 112 uh, footnotes in the white paper, we have tons of research, uh, that when you in, include a neutral in a process, it's, it's kind of like the Hawthorne effect. I don't know if you know in psychology, the Hawthorne. When we watch, when somebody's just there, all of a sudden we start to behave a little bit better. We don't, we're not as positional, especially if you can catch this early, 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 right? So um, the selection is also uh, done together. It's not my neutral, your neutral. No, this is, this is our neutral. We, we, we decide together who's going to help us. And that's why you often see they're not always mediators or arbitrators, but they often will be business folks who are coming in as experts because they're trusted advisors. Um, and the interesting thing is when you include trusted, uh, the standing neutral, most of the time they never have to make a formal recommendation because the simple fact that they're there cast this shadow that I guess I gotta, you know, be more transparent. So they encourage and facilitate transparency looking at a problem from different sides, and they very rarely have to actually make a recommendation. Isn't that magic, Zach? I think we're gonna work you out of a job if we have these uh, standing neutrals. And so, in, in addition, the continuous access. If it's not truly standing, it's at least standby. I don't have to wait and go, oh, well, let me go find an arbitrator and do that. We know in advance who this person is or who our board is. So they're, they're quick access. So it gives us a very quick turnaround time on these issues. So who are, issue, who are standing neutrals? Well, there's no one type as you've seen from the other chart. It could be a lawyer, could be a professional mediator or arbitrator, could be a consultant, right? We've seen it all. Um, they are always an expert in the subject matter of your, of your whatever it is you're doing. Right, so if it's an IT deal, you're gonna have someone who's an IT expert because again, they're giving you advice to how to solve the problem. They're, they're excellent facilitators. So many of you are mediators, so that's a, a, a skill that is absolutely, we wanna see that facilitation skill. And they're giving, you know, they're, they're not afraid to be objective and give people a dose of reality. They can be an academic, they can be a business person, um, but they should never, ever, ever work only on one side. They're never appointed by one, they're appointed by both. Um, you select them together, you contract with them together, you pay them. Their fees are split evenly between both parties. They work on behalf of both parties. So how do you engage a standing neutral? Uh, in the white paper, we actually have um, a, a little, uh, even like a, a, a process on how you do this, a checklist and a, an example of a standing neutral contract per se, you know, uh, and a little agreement. Um, but the two parties will work together to pick the, the standing neutral. Um, so once they have someone that they like, uh, they go in and they actually write up a little formal little contract. You're going to help me and you're going to show up to our quarterly meetings or you're on standby and I expect a week long turnaround time. So you're giving the rights, you're designing how you want the standing neutral to work. And if I look at these design principles of standing neutrals, right, there are six design principles. First and foremost, how many? Do you want one or three? It's not two, right? Because then they might pit themselves against you. So usually it's one or three. How engaged do you want them to be? Do you want them at all levels of governance, mid levels or only at the highest level? Remember the example flow chart that was at the mid level governance as well as the highest level. Um, do you want them to be standing or ad hoc? Do you want them to only give you advice, to give you non-binding recommendations, binding, recommendations so what level of authority are you going to give them 
And are you going to give them, you know, fact finding latitude? So if it's a bigger issue and they need to start digging in, can they hire some outside expert? Can they investigate personally? Or are they only just going to get the information you give them? So again, you're going to pick the role. You're going to design the role. And there are many types of support from transition. Zach talked about the transition of some of these big IT deals, right? So often having the neutral facilitate those little issues, right? Could be um, relationship health monitoring, could be onboarding of new people. A new person comes in, let me onboard the purpose of this relationship. As I mentioned with Microsoft, the key performance indicators. So in the white paper, we have 12 examples uh, of case studies and they kind of go in, they're, they're, they're somewhat significant. So they're not small, um, small little case studies. Actually, when I shared the case, uh, the white paper with Ellen, it, it's, it's like 80 pages. It's kind of like a mini book. So it is, it's kind of a big white paper, but we wanted to put the best of the best thinking that we saw of how organizations can really get in and prevent these disputes. So lots of different examples there that you can learn from. I mentioned the Microsoft one in uh, an outsourcing facilities management deal. One expert, you know, one standing neutral, mid-level of governance, standing, they were continuous, they could make non-binding recommendations and they could go in and investigate if there was a question on the metrics, they could go in and ask and dig in. And so this is a contractual, you know, it's like a subcontractor to both parties. And their focus was around alignment of metrics because there's fees, penalties and incentives associated with it and any issue resolution. When we're not performing, how, how are we going to go solve those problems? Right. Um, so the next one I want to just cover is the branding and licensing agreement. One neutral at the highest levels, ad hoc, right, when we need it. So it actually started out as upfront, not just ad hoc, but they uh, helped with the drafting of the deal. And in this case, they are given both mediator and arbitrator. It's the same person that can do both. First, they're going to put on their mediation hat. And if it's not solved, it's gonna to go to the arbitration hat and they can investigate personally. And what I find interesting is in this case, as well as in, the, uh, in some others, you never have to use them, right? They're just there, they kinda, of, you know, they're on call, you bounce a couple questions off of them and people are solving the problems much more closely. And so we're, we're solving those way early on. So with that, Zach, I'm gonna hand it back over to you and we're gonna hear from our experts because I'm just the academic who studies this stuff and I can tell you it works, but I, I love hearing from Sherry and David who are gonna say, this is what we do and how it works in practice. And Sherry, before we turn it over to you, let me just interrupt for a second to give the attendees the first CLO code, CLE code for this presentation. So the fourth code that you need to enter is dispute. Again, the fourth CLE code is dispute. So Sherry Fisher, turning it over to you to talk about a little bit about this um, based on your experience as a standing neutral. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Well, I think Kate gave one of the most comprehensive um, overviews I've seen of of the dispute resolution process. And really uh, the part, the continuum that, that I'm on is dispute prevention. And I really like how um, Kate is focused on that as well. If we can stay on this slide, this is exactly where I wanna be. That's perfect. So what Kate was talking about and what I wanna emphasize is during the construction process, during, during the actual um, construction project, um, that's where the dispute avoidance is, is really most beneficial. That's when you, that's when a um, dispute resolution board or a construction partner facilitator really add value. So most construction projects, um, you know, have issues. They're going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem somewhere along the way, just because of the complexity of construction problems, projects. Um, you know, there's normally, you know, it, it comes into, it could be a, a differing site condition, it could be a scheduling delay, it could be a, a conflict between the drawing and the specifications. We know those things are going to happen. And so I really like the way that we're able to be proactive in the solution. So normally what happens when, when, when I've seen construction projects not use um, dispute avoidance, you know, there's, there's poor documentation and then 
a lot of times the players change, right? You start out with one group of people and then the duration of a project, it might be five or six years and the players change. And then there are some procedures that exist, but then they're not followed. There are procedures for claims and all kinds of things, but people just don't follow them as far as even how you're supposed to document daily logs every day. And they're also, uh, so, so that begins um, a reactive approach where emails start flying. You know, the contractor will send an email to the owner saying, you know, oh, we're delayed. And the owner will, you know, send an email back. And that escalates into what we don't want. And when that happens, then relationships are broken and trust is broken. And that's when people stop talking and then they result to claims, arbitration, or litigation. So the nice thing is, is that when um, organizations that I've worked with have seen how um, the proactive approach of dispute avoidance works, um, that, that really is a benefit. You save money and you save time. And when you're working within the, within the constraints of the duration of the construction project, you as the owner or the construction company have more control over the outcome. When things go into litigation and arbitration, someone else is deciding for you um, the outcome of that project. So what I really wanna focus on today are two things. They are construction partnering facilitation and dispute resolution boards because the projects that I have been on, they've used them both hand in hand. They've not used one or the other, they've used them both hand in hand. So normally during, once the contract is signed, uh, they bring in a construction partner and facilitator. And what that person is, if you can think of someone who is a facilitator, someone who is really setting the stage for how we're going to move along the project. So when I've been involved as a partner and facilitator, normally I'll come in right after the kickoff meeting. And then the goal of that first meeting is to develop a charter where we talk about the common goals between the owner and the contractor. It could be between the designer and the owner. You could have several of them all together depending on how large the project is. For example, one of the projects that I'm working on with the Ohio Department of Transportation is a $227 million project that's spanning five years. So sometimes you can have a partnering facilitator working with the designer and the owner or all together. So it just depends. One of the things that we've done um, in that first uh, kickoff meeting is to decide on, like I said, the common goals. And then we create an issues resolution ladder, which Kate you know, kind of uh, gave an example of when issues come up, this is how we're going to resolve them. We're going to talk to, you know, talk to these two people. Then we're going to move it up the ladder to the next two people. Move it up to the ladder to the next two people, and then it might go off to a dispute resolution board, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, during that first meeting, we also create commitment statements. Commitment. A commitment statement could mean, um, you know, we we commit to having a safe project. We commit to having zero accidents. We commit to resolving issues at the lowest level. Uh, another thing that we, we do is we identify risks and then we develop a risk mitigation strategy. Again, most construction projects you know, are complex. And so we wanna talk to the parties at right at the front and say, hey, we're gonna have these risks, but let's think about how we're gonna mitigate them so that, so that they're not surprises when we come up. So really the goal of a partnering facilitator is to get everyone aligned and to create trust at the very beginning of the project. And so as we're talking about a dispute resolution board, and I think that, um, that you know, Kate did, like I said, did a really good job. The, the ones that I've worked on are either where you've had one person or you have three people. And um, in construction, it's always a technical expert. There are always people that have worked with that type of construction. Um, and most of the time, and you know, this, is, this has just been my experience, they say lawyers are not allowed. They don't want that, they don't want, they want people who really have been close to the work and who really understand the problems and who can offer solutions to how those problems can be solved. So they're technical experts. Um, the construction projects that I've worked on, normally they agree to meet on a quarterly basis. Uh, they tour the project, they walk, uh, walk the project site um, with the owner and with the general contractor. 
and they're not allowed to have uh, communications with the owner or the general contractor by themselves. So they all have to be together when they tour the sites. So they make sure, and what this does is make sure that they have a familiarity with what's going on with the project so that when an issue comes up, they'll already kind of be aware of where they are on the project. Now, in the case of COVID, now that, now that there's COVID, um, many times uh, uh, that has restricted them from touring the projects person to person. So um, if the projects um, have the have have money and have the availability, uh, I've seen where we've actually used drones to give site tours of the project where the um, where the different members of the dispute review board might be in a different location so they can actually tour the project and, and keep up with what's going on uh, on the project. Now, what does it typically cost? You know, people, you know, like Kate was saying, sometimes you you have these uh, people, you have a construction partnering facilitator, you have a dispute review board, and they're never used. You know, what, what does it cost? Well, typically what I've seen is if you have a three-member dispute review board, it can cost between $2,000 to $3,500 a day for each person. And that's for the quarterly meetings. And that's, again, if they, all, if they meet to resolve a dispute, however long that takes. Normally, that will take between one day and three days. And when you when you look at the cost of you know that on a five on a five year project maybe it's a hundred thousand maybe it's two hundred thousand dollars that's a small price to pay where on a project that's over two hundred million dollars one claim uh, can be a million dollars or more than a million dollars so so it's really um, balancing the cost between arbitration and litigation versus you know paying some cost up front to resolve those problems and i what i found and what many owners have found that it's well worth that cost um, so some resources um, i am a member of the dispute review board foundation um, they have some great resources great white papers great examples of of um, uh, of how you might want to implement that, how you might want to write those uh, clauses into your contract. They're great help. I know someone was asking, um, are dispute review board decisions binding or not binding? For the contracts that I've worked on, they're non-binding. So um, the owner and the um, contractor can choose not to use them. However, if they move on to arbitration and litigation, that information can certainly be used um, as a forerunner to whatever our arbitration or litigation uh, might occur. So those are those are some of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, I do have a, an example of a case with one uh, particular um, DOT, and I'll just give you an example. So there was a the of course the construction project was supposed to start at a certain time. Let's say September first. Um, of course, it didn't start at that time. Uh, and so that moved the construction work into the winter. And so the contractor had to drive some piers into the ground uh, because um, to drive some piers into the ground because it was a bridge. And they couldn't do that because of the winter. And so what that caused them to do was to delay it to the spring and that delayed the project. And so what happened was the owner and the contractor could not agree on whether it was a, whether, you know, what the delay was about and why that occurred. And so they couldn't resolve it. It, it. They went up the dispute resolution ladder like they were supposed to, they couldn't resolve it. And then it went to the dispute review board to settle. And so they looked at the contract documents and they were able to resolve, you know, give their opinion on, on the fact that yes, they thought that the contractor was delayed and that he was owed uh, money for that. So that's just an, one example of how, how dispute review boards are used on construction projects. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Zachary. Thank you very much, Sherry. And um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So let's quickly turn it over to David Friedlinger to talk about his perspective working with uh, standing neutrals. And um, if we don't have time for questions at the end, uh, I just want to let everyone know that our three panelists will be available, I believe, uh, during a breakout session at the lunch, uh, if you have questions or want to discuss anything with them. So David, uh, on to you. Hey, can I just interrupt one sec? I'm sorry. Um, Zach, you've got to 115. 
Oh, great. Okay. So, so hopefully we will have some time for, okay. for questions. All right. Then I can talk for long. Great. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, Zach. So, um, um, thanks, Kate and Jerry, for presenting your um, your view. Um, and I hope, Sherry, that lawyers are allowed here, because uh, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so um, I think, Kate, if we if we move to the next slide, I mean, you you present this, and you and I have been working together for, for a long time, and you, you presented this uh, already earlier, this deal with Telia and, and their supplier of Eolia, which was 16,000 tech sites all over Sweden connecting the, 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 the telecoms networks because of facilities management. It is still a facilities management, still ongoing. Now, I think I just want to present you this because, but just briefly, but then I want to add some dimension to what both of you have uh, been saying here also in, in the next few slides. So, in, in this case, standing neutral um, is one team. Actually, in this case, it's not me, it's uh, I had another role, it's, it's one of my colleagues um, who, who is, and it's brought in. As, as you can see, I mean, it's a possibility, of course, to bring in the standing neutral in all levels, also sort of on, on a more daily basis. I have seen that also sharing construction, actually, you have sort of um, the, the, the facilitator or the standing neutral being almost already out of the site, actually. But in this case, it's, it's sort of in the middle level governance and also in the executive level. And it's, as you said, Kate, I mean, it's... Just, standing neutral, so it's continuous, uh, continuous involvement. So it's also proactive and it's not only when, and I think this is important, it's not only when things comes up, when you start, when it starts to uh, get annoyed or emails are starting to be exchanged. And actually the, sorry, I have to off. I'm terribly sorry. Um, but uh, we are, you know, have a set number of meetings in those outsourcing deals, as many of you may, may know. I mean, there is their governance structure and their frequent meetings, etc. Understanding neutral, even though there's no dispute, is sort of invited before um, before that and, and to participate in some of, of the meetings. So it's not only sort of for the purpose of dealing with this, but really sort of preventing preventing disputes. And, uh, and it's also, as you said, Sherry, this is non-binding. Non but what I wanted to elaborate a bit more upon actually is because I, I think I have also, I have a background in, you took an example, Zach, from the software industry and I have a background in, in tech. So I've been doing sort of those ERP installation implementation projects, et cetera, and they, they are often, um, you know, lots, lots of trouble, uh, trouble there. But I, I think it's important to, to know and, and maybe it's obvious to everyone. I mean, the basic reason for needing a standing neutral arbitration set is because of conflicts of interests and, and, and misaligned expectations between the parties. So they get disappointed. I expected you to do this, so you didn't do that, you didn't treat me fair, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and and that is not given by nature that those sort of conflicts of interest interest should arise. Very often it's basically due to flaws in how the deal is designed. And I think, Kate, you, you mentioned the, the research project that you did in, in um, those, those seven years where you found this thing also with a standing neutral, but it led to this, to this entire business model, uh, and, and we, which is called the vested model, which is sort of a, a deal. It's, you call, it's a sourcing model where you have what's called a relational contract. It's a formal relational contract, and you have an outcome-based economic model, which it's sort of already from the beginning, it aligns the party's interests very strongly. And I, this is something I see in the construction industry, for example, and definitely in many IT outsourcing deals, et cetera. You build in conflicts of interest between the parties from the start in the actual deal, in the contract. Uh, and, and that can actually be prevented through this uh, with, with the best of it. So if you switch slide, Kate, please. Because in, in this deal with the TLA and the Olia, we actually, I mean, we was, and Joan here in, in the chat asked, but can't we add facilitation here? And this is what I want to come back to. So what, what we did together with, with EY uh, was acting as management consultant, we facilitated the design of the deal in the first place using this vested model, that where, where, which Kate is the architect of. And you, so you designed the deal in five steps and you really uh, 
try to find sort of your common vision goals. You have some guiding principles, moral principles like reciprocity, loyalty, equity, etc. that you transform into contractual norms. You design the deal from the start and, and then you include this pricing model. And, and then we act as neutral facilitators and you can and that can be called standing neutral also strange way i mean strange role for a lawyer i'm very comfortable now because i've been doing it for many years but typically as a lawyer you know you fight for your client and you should sort of kill the other party but in this case we, we say we represent the deal um, and already there you know in in the design of the deal we um, we act as facilitators but then they included uh, and this is what we often recommend, not least due to case recommendation and due, due to this research to sort of, well, why not continue with the standing neutral? Because it's it's one thing to design the deal, but then, you know, then the fund begins, so to say, you're going to do the ERP implementation or you're going to build the house or whatever. Um, and, you know, nothing, many things will not go as anticipated, uh, of course, and conflicts will arise. Hopefully, you will have avoided many of the conflicts in the first place because you have designed the deal in such a way. So you have sort of have found mechanisms to, to share risks and, and or to allocate risks, etc. And you have escalation procedures, etc. But things will go wrong also. But then the role of the standing neutral again. I mean, so that's part of the design of the deal. It's it's not really, which I think I have seen in other deals. It's not to sort of to prevent basic flaws in the design, but it's part of, of part of the design of the deal in the, in, in the first place. Now we create the contract. We want to align interests and expectations. Yeah, we think may, things may still go wrong, so let's include this standing neutral. And I think it's from this perspective we should, we should say this. If you go back to, to the previous slide, Kate, uh, ha having said this. Now, I mean, then you include again, it's, it was, I, I was participating in facilitating the deal and then it was a colleague who took over the role of the standing neutral here. So he's one and then he started with a startup meeting um, with, the, with the executive team in, in a strategic governance level and started to talk with them. Uh, okay, so now I'm the standing neutral uh, and these are the rules of the game here for this for this deal this this is the vision this is the desired outcomes that you have these are the principles that we act by what do you think about that etc so to really and there's a called it's it's kind of a what do you call it spirit of the contract is is very much of a, of a partnership and it's very much to always lead the parties back to that partnership mentality and to facilitate that discussion to really prevent the disputes from arising in the first place in this case though there was a great need and again that was my my colleague but he's next door to me so I was, uh, i'm very very close to it all of a sudden um uh, there was uh, information in the market that the supplier was going to be sold uh, and this was tricky of course because the supplier was carefully chosen because of you know we this is a long-term part we, we we trust them etc now they were going to be sold um, and uh, but then um, and, and that generated lots of conflicts um, of interest uh, and the buyer came in with sort of traditional procurement practices now we want to terminate for convenience and, and you know threaten with things like that and and in, in this this case it was sort of saved the deal actually i, I would say that um, my colleague then came in they called upon him and had these discussions but but again sort of nudge them back to no this is the game you're playing this is how the deal is assigned these are the side outcomes this is what you want to achieve these are the principles do you think it's really that bad that there's a change of ownership why not talk to the new owner in the first place etc etc and then that's, that's all the thing so that is what one thing i wanted to add and then you had some quotes here on the third slide kate um i i think so and and here are these quotes from Andreas and Ingrid here, they are really sort of quotes about sort of us acting as neutrals when doing the deal. And then I know they would sort of um, th think that also the standing neutral role of post contracting is also, uh, is also great, but that's one part of it. Uh, next slide, I will finish because this is uh, actually an, an IT outsourcing deal, then it's, it's not. 
um, software implementation, it's more, uh, I mean, like the cases you mentioned, Zach, this is a long-term IT outsourcing deal with infrastructure, software maintenance development and, and, things, um, and things like that. Um, and this is an interesting case actually, because they, they use this approach that we have, and I was also participating and facilitating this deal and, and, and design the contract, et cetera. But they, they sort of signed the contract before they uh, were really ready. So they, ha they, they had some things that were sort of missing from it to be ideal uh, in, in, in the deal. So me coming in here, my, my first assignment will be sort of to say, so let's fix those things in the deal, which we think are now not optimal, which may lead to conflicts of interest, actually. So, so they will have to sort of, and since I am a lawyer, I can also help them update the contract. I actually wrote the contract, so I can, I can also help them um, update the contract here. But then having done that, uh, then my role again will be, as in the Telia deal, you know, one, um, with, with one neutral facilitator. And, and I know this the, at the executive level, they have been working together for years uh, and, and they know each other, but it's easy to fall back into sort of traditional behavior. Now we have helped them doing a little bit of this part, partnership deal, so to say, uh, and they are used to more traditional, traditional and more poorly designed deals. So one of my main goals now of what I'm doing is to sort of to again to nudge them into this partnership mentality not deal with disputes but to allow them to talk to each other if disputes would arise how would you then act and do, do those kind of things of course when things arise because they will of course rise also um, take this sort of more traditional well, not traditional but this um, role sort of before becoming a mediator so those were some of the perspectives I wanted to share, uh, and, and maybe the main one being that uh, the, the need for a standing neutral, or I mean need for arbitration, is often because there's flaws in the design of the deal, and I think that is where it should start. All right, well, th thank you very much, David. And uh, before we go on, let me just quickly uh, again announce a uh, CLE code. So the fifth CLE code is partner. Again, the fifth CLE code is partner. So now we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, uh, but I'll go ahead and kick us off with a question. Um, and this is for all of our panelists. I, I guess, Kate, from, from your perspective, looking at the, the case studies that you've done, and then Sherry and David, looking at your experience as a neutral, when, disputes arise uh, that the neutral can't resolve or that end up leading to the failure of the project or the project uh, or the dispute going to litigation. What do you see as the factors that contribute to that uh, in your experience? Well, I, I want to echo what David said. It's that the, there's conflict of interest designed into the deal that were unintentional. So you have per unintentional perverse incentives that led to things and people don't have full transparency. They're only seeing their, your, their view. And so this is why I'm huge, a massive fan of having a deal architect because the deal architect would come in and say, hey, do you think about this? Or I think I've seen this perverse incentive. And it gets them to, de, uh, to, to eliminate those conflicts of interest as much as possible all the way down to the contract clauses. And if I if I could add also, Kate, on that, I mean, what we, I mean, I, I think many would recognize this working with contracts. We, we talk about there's a difference between the the real deal and the paper deal. So so quite often, I mean, there's a, a pay, and this is a concept I stole from Stuart McCauley, who was one, you know, the originators of relational contracting theory, uh, etc. So you, you know, I mean, the the, the so sort of lived relationship on a daily basis can, can be quite good actually. But it, that is when, but when you know, trouble starts to arise, and then you look into the contract, and the contract is actually written for war. So that's the difference between the real deal and the paper deal. And coming back to your question, Zach, what I see is that when new people come in, and Kate would call them the new sheriff in town, 
you know, because, and then they ruin the relationship, sort of the informal relationship that has been built between the parties and, and can be, you know, a new salesperson coming in, wanting to do things or, you know, a new chief procurement officer or whatever, <laughs> coming in, really destroying things. And that starts to generate uh, a vicious circle leading to uh, leading to disputes. So that is one of the reasons also, but that's also a flaw in the design of the deal, actually. So you should include in the contract rules for new onboarding new people coming in. It should be a breach of the contract if you don't do it. Right. I mean, if you think about it, the contracts, really the rules of how you're going to work and people put the contract in the drawer, it should be a living document. New people should understand the contract and not move away from the paper deal and the real deal. So you should always have continual alignment and be onboarding. And if something happens and causes the ch a need for a change, we don't want the real deal to, you know, to, to be changed without changing the paper deal. Because the no. further you get apart, the more it is to go to a dispute. And so people ask, I was uh, interviewed um, with Oliver Hart, a Nobel Prize winning economist by um, Harvard Business Review. And they said, well, have you ever seen when you have these deal architects and they follow the rules, do these deals go to court? And we're like, no, because they're designed not to. The whole reason is you deconflict it from the design and then you keep in behavioral economics, you're standing neutral, just simply nudges them back in. Hey, nudge, nudge, this is what you're gonna do. Oh no, business happened, we have to change. And so you're helping the teams, the partners be great partners, but they don't always know how to do that. They know how to buy and sell and, be, and, and not be together. And so you're facilitating, I love your word share, you're facilitating that partner and in a deal architect, you're going all the way down into the contract. And my experience has been basically uh, a belief system, the belief system of the individual. So um, when we're using DRBs and when we're using partnering facilitation, we're really trying to instill trust um, you know, between the two parties. But if someone has come from a background, for example, I worked for the Corps of Engineers for four years, and my job was claims manager on a large lock and dam project. So the people that I worked with in that case, um, for a long time, just had the mentality of the contractor's the enemy, he's trying to stick us. And so everything that they did, every action that they did was really adversarial and was really more of a protection type mode uh, as opposed to let's let's put all the cards on the table and let's see how we can work together. Okay. We have some great questions here in the chats. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one question from Joan, does the neutral facilitate formal changes to the contract during the life of the relationship or is it informal? So I would say you give that, that's a right you give to the neutral. So you may decide they don't have that right, or you may decide that you want them to do that. So you would design that into the role of your neutral, right? And, and what we would see is when people use the deal architect up front, um, the contract and getting an alignment is very important. So they would actually want their neutral to facilitate any changes, but it's something that, you, that maybe you don't want them to do and that's okay, right? And I now took this example in this IT outsourcing that actually this is what I will do. I will facilitate a change into the contract. But that's a bit unusual, actually, um, I, I, I would say. But of, of course, I mean, not, things do change in, in larger contracts. So, so and, and that can be a sort of long, painful discussions, renegotiations, basically. And definitely the neutral can be the need there. So in the construction projects that I've worked with, they have a formal change order process and the DRB nor the facilitator get involved uh, in that process. Great, and a question from Alan about the beginning stages of this. With a reluctant counter counterparty, what is the single most persuasive argument you find for convincing them to put these mechanisms in place? The most single, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Or your top few, if yeah. that's easier. Uh, Kate knows. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's kind of a, a, a hex because especially if you use a deal architect, people are like, oh, it's so amazing. We're so partnered. We don't need anyone. I'm like, no, this is, you need that. That's, um, but um, we would actually say um, the case studies and talking to people. 
right? So if you're in the construction industry and you're not using a dispute review board, you it, go talk, you know, Sherry, I'm sure would tell, would, would invite you to go talk to the people who are doing it. And they will tell you, wow, I'm so glad I did it. But it, it's, it's like any change, people don't, don't like change. And so it's different. It's more proactive. It's more preventive, you know, using that neutral. Why do I need a neutral? It's like, because you've got issues in your contract. And so when we, we kind of have this mantra, change the world one deal at a time. And so through people having the courage to do a pilot, you know, um, pilot it, try it. And then they like it, they tell other people. And then we have case studies. And then they, then someone else does one. So Telia, for example, now David, how many, how many deals have this Telia used you in, or used in a neutral in helping them? Uh, I think they have it in two out of four deals, but I mean, the two ones were really early. Um, yeah. So I think maybe Alan is asking here, per se is the most persuasive argument to use to stand in neutral. And if that's the question, uh, I, I think it may be simpler I'm just saying I haven't used it, but what I would use is what do you think will cost you the most to go to court or try to <laughs> prevent you to go to court? I mean, it's, I think it's sort of, that, that would be a pretty good argument. Yeah, I think the adage, an ounce of prevention, right? Um, you know, fire prevention instead of fighting fires. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen in construction, the most persuasive argument, it's really like a family reunion. The larger the project, the fewer the players. And so you're going to see the same players over and over. And uh, the benefit of using dispute review boards is you're, you are um, really uh, nurturing that relationship. So over time, again and again, you're nurturing that relationship as opposed to having a bad relationship with the first project. And then either either you've got construction companies who don't want to bid your work anymore because it's adversarial or you you continue to have bad relationships with the same contractor so to me that's a benefit is is having good relationships over the course of time great well with that we are at our time so i want to give a final thank you to all our panelists and for all the attendees and uh, like I said before, uh, at the lunch, there will be a breakout session where Kate, David, and Sherry will be available for more questions if you have them. Uh, but thank you all, and have a good rest of the, the session. Thank you. Thank you.